This webinar is one of a series of webinars provided by Douglas Laboratories as an educational service. In this webinar, we're going to focus on complete thyroid health and integrative approach. We're going to talk about thyroid hormone function and production with a big emphasis on, on function, what we actually can do to make sure that the thyroid hormones are working properly, as well as um, looking at the levels of them. This is the copyright and disclaimer information for the webinar. Um, this webinar and presentation is for educational purposes only. It's not meant as a substitute for, for professional medical advice. And we have other disclaimers and copyright information on this slide. If you need to review it thoroughly, you can pause the webinar here. When we talk about the functions of the thyroid, first and foremost, we all recognize that it affects the me metabolic rate, how much we burn calories. Uh, as much as that's important, we need to also recognize and let our patients know that it affects the growth and function of other body systems. Metabolism isn't just burning calories, it's tissue function properly. Uh, the thyroid hormones influence how we use carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and it also affects oxygen consumption in most tissues. One of the most important considerations when we look at the function of the thyroid is that it happens at the cellular level is that the thyroid hormone has to get inside the cell, has to communicate with the DNA, and has to uh, cause gene expression to affect the actual activity and function of that cell. And we're going to be spending uh, a bit of time focusing on that today because as we're going to learn, thyroid health is not just about thyroid hormone levels, it's about tissue response to thyroid hormones and the ability uh, of the body to do what it was designed to do based upon the uh, instructions that the thyroid hormone is given each cell. The thyroid gross anatomy is very well known to healthcare practitioners. We understand that it's, there's a um, larynx behind a thyroid cartilage. Uh, we know the thyroid has right and left lobes. It has an isthmus in the middle. And right below the thyroid, you can um, palpate the trachea. As most healthcare professionals know, the thyroid is, is directly um, accessible to palpation. And we're actually able to determine if there is um, any swelling or, or even some nodules can be palpated on it. So um, knowing the gross anatomy is very beneficial to being able to do part of the physical exam and see if there is any uh, swelling or nodules in the thyroid. When we talk about the thyroid gland, um, we know, but we're going to make sure our patients know that the thyroid gland is part of a much bigger system, part of the endocrine system, which is of course part of the bigger system, the human body. And many times the symptoms that uh, the public and sometimes we associate with thyroid problems could also be because of other endocrine disorders such as um, adrenal dysfunction, gonadal dysfunction, etc. So keeping that in mind, uh, we're going to be looking at the fact that uh, we're, while we're focusing on the thyroid hormone, keep in mind that some of the symptoms may be other conditions as well and that will be discussed when we talk about clinical evaluation and how to um, make sure we actually look at the thyroid and not other uh, functional disorders. Noting that the thyroid gland is part of a much bigger endocrine system, we first recognize that the hypothalamic pituitary axes have tremendous control over the endocrine systems. We'll be talking about the specific axes on um, other webinars, some of them, like we'll be talking about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axes in an upcoming one on adrenal health, and we'll be talking about the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis in one on um, in both women's health and men's health. But in this webinar, we're going to focus on the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis and the role it has in thyroid function. Once the um, body recognizes a change in the thyroid hormone levels, it's going to um, have specific effects and uh, the, the pituitary gland has uh, a cluster of cells, you know, the paraventricular nucleus that are going to secrete thyrotropic releasing hormone and that in turn is going to cause the pituitary gland to release thyroid stimulating hormone. We're going to be looking at the effect of thyroid stimulating hormone on thyroid tissue and we're also going to look at what happens when we don't have proper TSH uh, response by the thyroid gland. The hypothalamic pituitary axis is it specifically involved in the hypothalamus releases thyrotropic releasing hormone to the pituitary gland when it senses low thyroid hormone levels circulating in the body. In turn, the pituitary gland sends out thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. The most important part of this whole thing is what TSH actually does. TSH goes to the thyroid cells and it's going to do a number of specific actions. It's going to increase iodide uptake. Um, by stimulating the expression of sodium iodide supporter proteins. We'll discuss that in more detail in a moment here. It's going to promote organification of iodine 
the actual attach of that iodine to an organic molecule, specifically thyroglobulin. And of course, TSH promotes thyroglobin production and it also promotes secretion of T3 and T4. So TSH is, is an integral part of proper thyroid function. But as we go through the rest of this webinar, we're going to see that it's not the only point of how thyroid hormones work in the body. It's much more than making and releasing the hormones. The hormones have to be activated in some cases, and they have to be able to integrate themselves into the tissues of the body. And to see how TSH affects uh, thyroid function, we're going to first look at the thyroid microanatomy. In this picture, you can see that there are thyroid follicles, or they look like vacuoles, or empty places without cells. And the thyroid epithelial cells, or thyrocytes, line those thyroid follicles, and they secrete thyroglobulin into it. And then after that thyroglobulin has been acted upon by enzymes within the thyroid follicles that attach iodine to the thyroglobulin, the thyrocytes are going to take that back up. And so to get really into detail of that, we're going to look at a pictographic image of how this takes place here. And what you'll see here, again, is the follicle on the right-hand side surrounded by thyroid thyrocytes, thyroid epithelial cells. And then, of course, you see blood vessels above the follicle and to the left and to the lower right. So this is where it really gets interesting. This is a pictograph of thyroid hormone synthesis. And what we're looking at here is a, a, a thyrocyte or thyroid cell. And on the left-hand side, you first all see how the blood provides iodide molecule, which is taken up by the sodium iodide supported protein. As you mentioned earlier, that protein activity is enhanced and stimulated by thyroid stimulate hormone. Um, then the, the thyroid side is also encouraged to make thyroglobulin. Um, and you can see the thyroglobulin is, is created. And once the thyroglobulin is created, it's excreted into the thyroid follicle. Now remember, the thyroid globin has no iodine attached in the beginning. And once it's secreted into the thyroid follicle, it's acted upon by thyroid peroxidase. You may remember that. We often test for thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Keep that in mind. And the thyroid peroxidase is going to cause iodinization and attach iodine to the, um, the tyrosine moieties of the thyroid globulin, um, very large protein that it is. Uh, then further on, we'll see some conjugation of those um, um, tyrosine uh, components of it. And once that happens, the, the thyroid globulin with the iodinization having taken place is taken back into the cell. And then the thyroid hormone is lysed from the thyroid globulin. And of course, the thyroid globulin is disassociated in the body. We use those parts. But the cell is actually going to take thyroxin and try to thyronine and uh, ex expel them out of the cell to be taken up by the general circulation and secrete throughout the body. But keep in mind, this is one step of how thyroid functions. There's a number of processes that take place here, and each of those we can see how we can enhance them with different therapies. So in previous slides, we've alluded to the reality that there are a number of specific actions that are required for the proper production and function of thyroid hormones. We're going to go over that list right now. The first couple have already discussed. Number one is iodine has to be made available for thyroid cells. And, um, and the second step was that the iodine has to in, in get inside the thyrocytes. And that takes place specifically by sodium iodide symporter proteins under the direction of TSH. TSH also stimulates the thyrocytes to make T3 and T4 and to also secrete the uh, T3 and T4 from the thyrocytes into general circulation. As many of us know, the thyrocytes make both T3 and T4, although they primarily make T4 into a lesser amount, T3. So this brings up the next question is, how do we get more of that T4 converts to more bioactive T3, the triodothyronine, uh, which is much more um, metabolically active? And then the next question we have to discuss is, how do you get those hormones inside the cells of the body? And that's going to be discussed in thyroid receptors and um, heterodimetrization, how we have to pair together two different proteins to create receptors to get the thyroid inside the cell, then how do we get that cell to actually bind to the DNA, and then does it actually, after it binds, does it promote genetic expression by work with the messenger RNA? So as you can see, the number of steps to actually go from production to final manifestation of what thyroid hormones do, and those things we'll be looking at next. The first three of those seven specific actions can be seen in the pictograph that discusses thyroid hormone synthesis. 
the first action is to provide iodine to the thyrocyte, present to the thyrocyte. The second action is that the iodine is taken up by the thyrocyte due to the function of the sodium iodide symporter protein under the influence of TSH as we discussed earlier. The third specific action is the actual production of the thyroid hormones. This involves a number of different steps. The first being thyroid globin production by the thyrocyte. Second, the, it's um, exocytosis into the thyroid follicle. Then under the influence of thyroid peroxidase, iodinization will take place. So the iodine is actually attached to the thyroid globulin. Then we have conjugation where the different um, tyrosine um, fact components of the um, thyroid globulin are um, added together there. And then we have endocytosis taken back into the thyrocyte, proteolysis removing the thyroid hormone from the large, very large actually, thyroid globulin molecule. And then the thyroxin and triethyronine, the T4 and the T3, are secreted into the general circulation. The next specific action involved in thyroid hormone function is the hormone conversion to the most active form. In the periphery throughout different tissues we have enzymes called iodothyronine deionidase enzymes, types 1, 2, and 3. And depending upon which enzyme is most active, we're going to convert T4 into T3, the most active form of thyroid hormone. Remember T3 is four times more potent than T4. On the other hand, if the body's making a lot of type 3 enzyme because of a pathology going on, such as after critical illness or, or chronic um, severe illness, um, you're going to have deionization of the inner ring and you're going to make reverse T3. Now keep in mind reverse T3 is the brake pedal. It goes to the iodine receptor and says do nothing. So it, it's, a, it's a competitive antagonist. It antagonizes the thyroid receptor and prevents actions from taking place there. And so um, the, uh, the goal obviously is to make more T3 and more reverse T3. Uh, the final product is um, uh, of catabolism and breakdown of the thyroid hormones is of course T2 of various forms and those are uh, thyroid hormones that are inactive. They're not as competitive as reverse T3 and they're more easily um, ex uh, excreted through the body through the urine. And the final three steps uh, are the steps involved in how the body actually responds to thyroid hormones. The fifth step is the production of thyroid receptor hormones. This requires the binding together of two different proteins, the RXR and the TR, which we'll discuss shortly. And um, then the next step is that that receptor has to actually bind to the DNA, which requires additional assistance. And the final step is the tissue response, the re function of messenger RNA, to actually have that cell do what it's assigned to do, make a certain protein that will change the function of that cell. So the last three steps actually are tissue response. It isn't just about the thyroid hormone levels, it's about the listening, the ability of these cells to listen to thyroid hormones. And this is one of the most critical parts of improving thyroid function in our patients. Many times we'll see patients that have, quote, normal thyroid hormone levels, but they're still miserable. And a big part of that's because of receptor resistance. As we can have insulin resistance, we now understand you can have thyroid hormone resistance. Likewise, we can also have estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and corticoid receptor resistance, as we'll discuss in the future. But um, tissue response is, is uh, one of the greatest um, um, insights that are going to help us improve the quality of life in our patients. Now that we're familiar with the specific actions of thyroid function, which we're going to review throughout this webinar a couple of times, we're going to next turn attention to thyroid lab tests, and we're going to see specifically what these tell us about thyroid function. These are lab tests that I classically use for thyroid function. I believe most of us are using these, if not all of these, and most of these. The first one, of course, is TSH. As we understand, that stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, it's a, it tells us about HPT function. Is the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid, you know, doing what it's supposed to do as far as giving instruction? The next group of um, lab tests that are very important is the antibodies. Now, the antibodies are normally only considered of checking to see if a person has autoimmune disease, but that's very important because if there is autoimmune disease going on or inflammation, then we're not having proper thyroid activity. And I say or inflammation because sometimes the first thing we'll see is leaking of the anti-TPO antibodies when the thyrocytes are irritated. Um, they'll, they'll leak um, thyroid peroxidase, then we have antibodies, and that can be one of the very first signs of, of thyroid um, cell uh, insult um, that can happen for a number of different reasons. 
The third cluster of tests include, of course, measuring the hormones, T4, T3, and reverse T3. We're going to be discussing each of these in more detail, but understand that uh, T4 is the primary hormone released by the thyroid. T3 is the more activated form that has to um, happen with conversion, and uh, reverse T3 is, is a converting appropriately. So we'll actually talk about the lab test is helping us determine how proper conversion takes place here. Without actually measuring all three of these hormones, we really can say we understand what's happening with the conversion because T4 and T3 don't let us know if there's an inappropriate or shift towards reverse T3 that may sneak up in the patient if we don't keep a close eye on it. One of the best ways to evaluate uh, lab tests, whether it be thyroid or other lab tests, is to do percentile analysis of, of the data. This gives us a very clear indication as to how healthy the patient is and are we drifting towards problems. Uh, very easily what we do is we take the patient value and subtract the low reference range value from that. And what that does is it tells us how far the patient is into the reference range. And we divide that by the actual width of the reference range, which is the high reference range minus low reference range, and then of course multiply that by 100 to get the percentile. So an interesting picture here is we look at a patient who at first glance 2.8 is oh that's great it's in the reference range because the reference range is 2.3 to 5.0 but when you do percentile analysis you see that she's actually in the 18th percentile the clinical significance of this is is that we now know that many patients that have t3 and t4 levels in the in the 30th percentile or below that have clinical symptoms of hypothyroidism can now be recognized as subclinical hypothyroidism, meaning that they don't have the disease of being below the magic number of the low end of the reference range, but their thyroid levels are low enough that we could recognize they have some degree of hypofunction. One way I'll help patients understand this is I'll say, when we compare you to the rest of the population, 82% of other people have better thyroid function than you do because you're at the 18th percentile. And that helps the patient understand why we need to look at improving thyroid function. To expand further on the use of percentile analysis, this is a case I'll share with you. An 18-year-old female complained of fatigue, weight gain, rash behind her knee, acne, elevated ESR and CRP were also um, noted. And um, we also notice uh, vitamin D deficiency and anemia. Of interest, you'll notice that we mentioned some inflammation going on there, the rash behind the knee, the acne, and the elevated ESR. And what we recognize here is, is something really quite fascinating. The TSH is at the 27th percentile. Her, her body doesn't feel like it needs more thyroid. It's, it's quite satisfied. It's not putting out a big signal. So if you would just measure TSH, you would say, oh, she's fine. She has no problems. But then we look at her. Um, you know, free T3 and free T4, we see that her free T3 is at the 18th percentile, as you saw on the previous slide, and her free T4 is at 28th. So both of these are below that 30th percentile that suggests she could have subclinical hypothyroidism. Then we, it's interesting to notice that a reverse T3 is having no problem being pumped out. It's at 42%. It's not elevated yet, so we need to be, you know, fair and honest about that. But we're seeing that she's having trouble making T3 at 18th percent, but reverse T3 is 42nd percent. So you see a shift there of the uh, free T3 to reverse T3 ratio. Now what really gets our attention is the elevated anti-TPO antibodies. Keep in mind that when the thyrocytes are irritated or stressed or insulted in any way, then they can kind of, as I explained, leak thyroperoxidase and you'll see TPO. This is one thing that we'll see before we see antithyroglobin antibodies in most cases. So what we're seeing here is an inflamed thyroid that is having trouble making enough the T3 and T4 and there's enough stress going on that there's a slight shift towards reverse T3. In that case that we just saw about the 18 year old with the acne and the other signs of inflammation, what we're talking about is the relationship between inflammation and thyroid health. The literature is now starting to tell us this sobering data actually that obesity increases the susceptibility to actually have elevated antithyroid antibodies. So um, the, and the way of saying that is we're going to see more antithyroid proxies antibodies as, as patients get more and more obese. And the presence of these antibodies may actually predate overt disease by months or years. So the patient is not showing low T3, low T4, but we're seeing low thyroid antibodies and we're recognizing that they go into that subclinical hypothyroidism state. Now for that 18-year-old patient, her therapies included 
diet and exercise, of course, to promote weight loss. Omega-3 specifically, uh, the fish oils, EPA and DHA, thyramine and selenomethionine, which we'll be talking about a little bit, and then closely monitor to um, keep an eye on her thyroid hormones to see if they are, you can move them back in the right direction. We will look at one more case here. We're not going to do a bunch of different lab tests. That can be discussed in future webinars or other uh, material that we can help you understand lab tests if you're new to this. But this is just an interesting case that I couldn't help but want to share with you. Uh, it's a 10-year-old female with developmental disorder. Um, she'd been seen by a number of clinicians before this physician saw her. And um, what happened is they all said that there's no problem with the thyroid. She had normal TSH. And as you can see, they're fine. Her TSH is within reference range in both times. However, on further evaluation, it was noticed that she had low free T4 by this clinician, and her free T3 was only at the fourth percentile. Okay, so 96% of people had better T3 than her. So we all, um, it was also noticed that she had anti-TPO, anti-TG antibodies. Again, this child has autoimmune thyroid disease. She has elevated antibodies. Uh, her T3 level was, you know, quote normal. Her T4 was not, but her TSH was within normal range. Again. More than anything else, this tells us TSH does not provide valuable information. Um, assessing TSH is many times gets in the way of proper patient care. If all we're measuring is TSH, they were missing this case and countless other cases. I know I'm preaching to the choir that everyone that um, that is is moving forward into integrative medicine looks beyond just TSH, but we need to um, feel confident that we're doing the right thing when we see cases like this. Having looked at a few lab tests, we can visualize another way of, of understanding what these lab tests are helping us see in the human body. Uh, TSH is telling us about the instruction that's taking place between the hypothalamic pituitary axis and the thyroid gland. Is it being instructed to make thyroid hormones? The anti-TPO and anti-TG antibodies, which tell us are the thyrocytes being hurt or not, can give us an insight into production. Uh, and obviously looking at the T3 and T4, that will actually tell us our production. But T3 and T4 and reverse T3, when looked at collectively, they're actually telling us about conversion, what's happening in the body. Is it actually making the best form of the thyroid hormone or is it shunting towards the most um, inappropriate form or undesirable form, reverse T3? Uh, but this doesn't tell us everything yet. There's something missing here about thyroid function and that has to do with um, assessing the clinical presentation. So now we understand that the instruction, production, and conversion a little better. The next important point is reaction. Is the body reacting properly to the thyroid hormone? Uh, and their way of looking at that is, is the tissue responding? And that doesn't come to us through lab tests. That comes to us through clinical evaluation, looking at signs and symptoms to actually um, assess quality of life. And this is going to take us to the next um, section of this webinar. Clinical assessment is just as important as the diagnostic lab test because it, it actually gives us part of the diagnosis. I always let me, like to remember that the word diagnosis literally means complete knowledge. And in reality, we never have complete knowledge, but the closest we're going to get is to be looking at both the uh, objective data that lab tests give us and to look at the subjective data that comes through uh, part of the clinical session protocol. So the first thing we're looking at is what are some of the signs and symptoms that the patient's experiencing. The signs and symptoms that we commonly associate with um, low thyroid function can be quite numerous. The list seems to grow every time I, I look around. Um, but there seems to be a consensus that some of these symptoms are pretty classically seen in most um, hypothyroid conditions. At the top of the list obviously seems to be fatigue. Patients complain of this global fatigue. They can't figure out why. Low body temperature, uh, weight gain. Then we have the different neurocognitive things from brain fog all the way to slow thinking and mood disorders. We start to see sexual dysfunction, sleep disorders. We see changes in the, um, the hair and in the skin and um, um, you know, bowel function, etc. Um, some of the other conditions could include uh, fluid retention, um, you know, recurrent headaches, recurrent infections, uh, and again, more problems with the skin and body hair, the enlarged tongue um, with teeth imprints on the tongue because that's related often to the fluid uh, retention. And go all the way through other um, metabolic conditions such as increased cholesterol, of course, all the way down to joint stiffness and muscle aches and pains. But the problem is that these symptoms can also be associated with other conditions. So are we looking at hypothyroidism or is this person having adrenal dysfunction? Is it a woman going through menopause or PMS? Is it a gentleman going through andropause? Is it, um, 
you know, someone who's just sleep deprived and living off of caffeine. Um, so we need to look beyond that and, and um, to get a better view and, and interpretation of these signs and symptoms, it's just as important that we look at risk assessment. Risk assessment allows us a different dimension in assessing our patients. You know, the patient can present with all these symptoms, but are they really at risk for it? Or would we say that, you know, you have all these symptoms, but you have none of the risk factors. So we need to look at, you know, a adrenal somatic condition. Some of the common risk, risk that are associated with thyroid disease that, that we all know can be documented in the literature are um, increased autoimmune diseases. This includes uh, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and, and sarcoidosis. But also look at celiac disease as a autoimmune uh, associated disease. Uh, there's a very high association between celiac disease and thyroid disease. Um, I asked the patient in the health history, have they ever been treated for thyroid disease or thyroid condition? Because you know, a woman just says, well, I had thyroid problems you know, when, she, when I had a baby years ago. She is statistically more likely to have thyroid disease in, in, um, in subsequent and later years in her life. Um, any patient that's ever been on lithium amiodarone has a much higher incidence of thyroid disease. And I, I just mentioned that because even though those patients are routinely monitored, for thyroid, I've seen a couple of cases where they weren't being monitored, and yes, um, they can increase incidence of disease. Um, uh, diet, lifestyle and diet have a significant impact if they've ever smoked, if they've ever taken a um, high dose of iodine. I know that there's um, some mythology out there about massive dose of iodine are going to restore the thyroid function. As you go through the function of the thyroid, you're going to see that it's a lot more than just giving the body iodine. And we do know from international literature and even on human study, on human studies, not just animal studies, that um, when you get above 1,100 micrograms of iodine, there's an increased incidence of, um, uh, of thyroid irritation, of leaking of thyroperoxidation, thyroperoxidase antibodies, no sequela, moving towards autoimmune thyroid disease. Um, so that's something to consider. If you have any questions about that, drop an email. We'll go over some of the literature together. Um, does a patient avoid all of these foods, salt, seafood, dairy, and seaweed? Yes, dairy is a very good source of iodine in the um, standard American diet, not just seafood. Um, but we see people now, they're becoming, you know, they stay away from salt, they're off of dairy. And then if they won't eat seafood, um, you know, they may be iodine deficient. So keep that in mind. Are they getting um, some type of sea vegetable or seaweed in their diet? Most people aren't. And do they often eat raw Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, kohlrabi, um, millet, rutabagas, etc.? The, the, the reality is, is raw amount of the cabbage family have been associated with causing some thyroid distress. There's a lot of um, excessive fear about the cruciferous family, which is unfortunate because as we all know, the cruciferous family can decrease risk of um, toxic estrogens. Um, but the paper that I've found, the only one I've found about it, was a woman who ate two kilograms of bok choy a day for a month, and she wound up with, um, um, you know, a, a goiter because, um, first of all, I don't think she's eaten four pounds of um, of raw anything <laughs> that long a period in time, and um, you know, so that was private. We don't see that in people who eat the the cooked vegetables, but there is a lot of anxiety around that. I just tell people to to not eat too much of them raw. Family history, genetic parents, grandparents, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, have any of them have an autoimmune disease or have any of them have thyroid disease? That increases the patient's risk of having it. Women, there's um, an association with increased risk for thyroid disease and women who have PMS, PMDD, and PCOS, especially PCOS, quite a bit of literature on the correlation between those two conditions. Uh, excessive menstrual bleeding um, may be a, a sign of hypothyroidism. Um, every time a woman gets pregnant, it increases her likelihood of having um, thyroid disease because of all the, the ties of hormones and the stress that that causes in the thyroid. Uh, a miscarriage also increases likelihood that there is a uh, thyroid dysfunction going on. And statistically, as a woman gets 40 years of age or older, the likelihood of developing thyroid disease can, can um, increase. Men, whenever there's erectile dysfunction or gynecomastia, uh, there's an association with higher association with thyroid disease and 50 years or older. You remember, some of these are association. It doesn't mean that if you're over 40, you have thyroid disease. It just means risk possibilities and worth assessing. So if you have all these symptoms and you have all this different family history and lifestyle and diet and personal history, then yeah, you may have a thyroid um, thing going on. But if you don't have these and you have all those symptoms, 
when we look at other things such as adrenal or gonadal dysfunction. One of the tools I've been using for years is um, different questionnaires, as many of you have seen in some of the other work I've done. But the, the, the hypothyroid risk questionnaire is something that I use as both an educational tool to help patients understand what we're doing and also as a tool to track symptoms and, and look at risk assessment. This questionnaire, you can go to your hormones.com questionnaires, download it, and use it. And it, it has all the symptoms we talked about, plus the risk, and then it plots on a, on a table um, whether you have a high or a low probability based upon your number of symptoms compared to the number of risk. As I said, it's a valuable tool, not just for um, clinical assessment and management, but also as uh, a patient educational document. And again, to reiterate, one of the reasons that we're talking about symptoms and risk factors is we're trying to establish the body's response to thyroid hormones. While the lab test can tell us a lot about hormone levels and the antibodies can tell us if the thyroid is being attacked, they really don't tell us how the bodies respond to thyroid hormones. That comes by assessing the symptoms and the risk factors. Through assessment of symptoms, we can get a really good picture as to the health of the cells, are they listening to the hormones. And um, so that's one of the reasons why the thyroid risk is, um, question was developed and again it all goes back to the picture of that cell is the cell listening how do we know it's listening because we're listening to your, the symptoms you're, you're sharing with us and understanding if you have the quality of life or if there's um, problems with thyroid function understanding now that the body's ability to respond to thyroid hormones is basically affected by the health of cells we're going to next turn our, our attention to how do we maintain health of cells and this is going to be discussed in clinical management everything from diet and lifestyle to um, different herbal therapies we can use to improve tissue response to thyroid hormone so obviously the next step in this process is to actually talk about clinical management we're going to be talking about the specific steps we take as far as improving thyroid function um, intervention Lifestyle management is still one of the most important first steps for optimal hormone function, whether it be thyroid, adrenal, gonadal, or, or, any, or blood sugar, any type of hormone imbalance. Um, what I've found is important that I review these with each patient because we can't assume that patients understand the most basic information. Many of them do. We live in a culture that a lot of the media talks about health, but um, sometimes that's misinformation and people may get caught in one point. They need the full picture of it also. Uh, I make sure I spend some time with every thyroid patient to discuss their diet with them to make sure they get adequate rest and sleep. You know, they, they seem to think that they can get by with five or six hours sleep and then drink lots of caffeine and that that's not going to affect not only the thigh but the adrenal glands um, that's just impossible they need the rest and relaxation as well um, exercise and recreation is critical they need time to get away from stress and to play and just be out in the real world and then, um, get some rewards in life social interaction is very important there's a higher association with uh, isolation, with a, a number of different morbidity and mortality now this time to talk about, that lifespan is actually decreased with social isolation. Um, hydration is something that every patient needs to be discussed uh, with because the, the, uh, I'm still seeing people that you do the little skin test and the, the skin sticks again in the back of the hand. I used to only see that in hospitals, now I'm seeing it out in the general public. So hydration is definitely part of the picture. And obviously bowel elimination is the body being overburdened by endogenous toxins because not having proper function. First and foremost, optimal thyroid health requires a healthy lifestyle. And um, don't take for granted your patients know that because um, you'd be surprised how many times they, they miss a couple of these very important points. I like to use what I call the foundation of health in basically almost every patient to make sure that they're getting the foundations that they need to um, achieve our, our goal whether it be a thyroid, adrenal, or someone with rheumatoid arthritis. I've found that all patients need to be given instruction on basic nutritional support with a high grade multivitamin mineral. If they come into us it's because the body's under stress. They may have malabsorption problems because of the stress they're under because of the toxicity. Vitamins and minerals um, just give them the, the full scope of them to make sure they're not missing anything. Uh, one thing I often say to patients is, um, you know, your, your body may get a hormone to go to a cell and say to do something, but the cell may say, well, I'd like to do that, but I need some, you know, riboflavin and some chromium and some zinc, and I don't have enough to on back order. And so um, just make sure you have all the nutrition you need. The best way is a high grade multivitamin mineral. Essential fatty acids, specifically omega-3, EPA, and DHA, 
are very important for cell membrane health and cell membrane integrity. We know they affect hormone receptor function. So when we talk about hormones, we can't leave out the EPA and DHA. And we're going to talk against about that a little more specifically in just a moment here. Probiotics help with the normal bowel function. They integrate with the immune system and um, obviously inflammation, and they can also decrease risk of autoimmunity. So those have to be included. When you talk about diet, talk about general healthy diet as far as, you know, more plant-based, uh, less of the fatty meats and, you know, chicken fat and all this other stuff, get into lean protein sources. But one thing I, I look at the diet patients is many times we have to look at the possibility of celiac disease and that can be ruled out. I have a picture of one of my um, most favorite documents written years ago called Celiac Disease Associated Autoimmune Endocrinopathies and you can see the number there too. I'm going to PubMed and get that. And um, there's a very strong association with um, celiac disease and autoimmune thyroid disease and um, look for family history. If there's any autoimmune disease that may be something you want to consider first and foremost. As I mentioned, one of the most important initial foundation of health is a high-grade essential vitamin and mineral supplement. Uh, patients don't just need one vitamin, they need all of them. They need the, all the B vitamins, the, the, the beta carotene, the retinoic acid, all these things, the, um, all the different tocopherols. I routinely put on um, my patients on, I may use Ultrain of 10 as I've pictured here, a lot of them put on Ultrain of 3. Um, I, I, I like to make sure that they, they get some vitamin A as well, that's why I'm um, choose a vitamin that has vitamin A, not just beta carotene, like, like ultra M3. And then I, um, in many cases, I put them on a low dose of the primary vitamin, then a second dose of, um, they'll take one of the uh, B complex, maybe take one in the morning, one with new to help with the fatigue. The B complex of metafolin has, as you know, the activated form of folic acid. It also has the active form of B6, paradoxal 5-phosphate. It has the best form of B12, um, methyl bombing. It's just a really good one of the best B complex I've ever seen in, in the decades I've been using B complexes. Um, and that really plays a big role in helping these patients overcome some of their fatigue. And as you can see in the upper right hand corner, all the different trace minerals are important to our patients. But in all that, I remind them that one of the primary sources of this has to come from the diet as well. So be eating legumes and seeds and nuts and vegetables and, and all these things to get your, your vitamins and minerals. And we're using this as a supplement just to make sure, especially when they come to us in a, um, a state of um, not feeling too well. <laughs> And of those vitamins and minerals, one that's very important for thyroid health, as I know we're aware of, is the micronutrient selenium. Uh, selenium is required for a number of selenoproteins that are, are required for proper thyroid health. We're going to be discussing some of these, the, the iodine, thyroid, and type 1, 2, and 3. We'll be discussing in a little bit here. Um, selenium is very important because what they've found is a, a number of human studies that if you give them 200 micrograms of selenomethionine, it will significantly decrease antibodies against thyroproxase, so it seems to stabilize the uh, thyroid function, the inflammation is going on by stabilizing enzymes. Now on this page, on this um, image here, what you'll see is I have little numbers underlined. Those are actually hyperlinks in the original um, PowerPoint presentation. And if you pause the video here, you can actually take those numbers, write them down, go to pubmed.gov and enter that number and you can actually download and um, read those papers yourself. So just so you know, that's what those numbers represent as you go throughout this website. After nutritional support, um, one of the next steps of the foundation of health is essential fatty acids. I know we're all very familiar with this, we'll be brief, but the reality is, is that the essential fatty acids are important for cell membrane health and also to help control some of the inflammation that can interfere with proper thyroid function. Um, go ahead and take um, some time to read the Nutri news I wrote uh, in the past here of omega-3 essential fatty acids. Inside you'll find some good references that give us some good doses guidelines. In a nutshell, 20 milligrams per kilogram is important just for baseline health to prevent the onset of disease. And if you have any autoimmune disease or any other significant inflammation, 40 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, in, in these cases, I typically use uh, the Quell uh, high EPA or high DHA. Um, though two of those will give about 950, 975. 
or I use um, Opt EPA. One of those is 500. So um, depend upon the patient's need, other needs. Um, I find all of those products be very beneficial to give patients the essential fatty acids they need. Keep in mind that some patients get confused when they hear about omega threes and and they read to take um, flaxseed oil. Well, uh, as you see in the graphic, which is also in the Newton News, um, alpha linoleic acid is the very top of the metabolic pathway of omega three, and you can see they have to go through a number of different processes to get um, alpha linoleic acid to convert to EPA and DHA. And the reality is even if best case scenario, you're only going to convert around 5% and you'll see references on that in the document. So what I say to the patients is let the fish do the work for you. The third important step for the foundation of health is probiotics. Uh, I know probiotics have been getting a lot of attention over the years and I'm glad to see more research coming out. One of the most interesting uh, discoveries of probiotics is they there's, there's uh, data that suggests they may actually decrease the development of autoimmune endocrinopathies. Now the paper I look at specifically is an animal study showing that uh, using probiotics with multiple strains of lactobacilli, bifidobacter, and um, uh, streptomophilus um, prevents autoimmune diabetes in animal studies. But then I look at other human papers. On the other side you'll see that IBS patients treated with, again, multiple strain probiotics um, had the cytokine levels return back to normal levels with the proper um, IL-10 to IL-12 um, ratio. Uh, keep in mind here that what we're talking about in autoimmune disease is, is a change in the um, Th1, Th2 cytokines that become too predominantly uh, pro-inflammatory, pro-autoimmune. And we have a, a number of papers, not just these two, that say yes, probiotics change TH1 to TH2 ratios to become away from the pro-inflammatory, pro-autoimmune picture there. So um, that's one of the, in and of itself, a very good reason to get on probiotics to, to protect the patient's immune system. Other papers that have started to give us some inkling that um, how probiotics can benefit thyroid function um, is showing they can affect cellular signaling. Uh, there's actually one that talks about gene expression, which is pretty um, exciting. We're going to be mentioning that later on in, in this webinar as well. And obviously cytokines. So probiotics is a definite real need for a foundation of health. So complete thyroid health requires, again, first of all, healthy lifestyle, and then make sure they get on good essential nutrients, all the vitamins and minerals we've talked about, essential fatty acids, um, high amounts of EPA and DHA, and probiotics to decrease the um, development of autoimmune endocrinopathies. Um, and then only after, after that we can um, look at addressing the seven specific actions involved in the production function of thyroid hormones. Now in everything that we do, our primary goal is to improve the response to thyroid hormones. And we're about to get into those, addressing those seven specific steps. But before we do that, keep in mind that, that we can use the um, hypothyroid risk questionnaire to assess these symptoms, weigh them against the risk factors, and monitor changes in the patient's response to thyroid hormones. Okay, now we're going to get into the seven specific actions that are involved in the production function of thyroid hormones. We're going to go each of these in detail, but for a quick overview and to get us really familiar with each of these steps because they're critical for our understanding and, and more importantly our patient's understanding as to why we want to um, improve thyroid function beyond just looking at thyroid hormone levels is the first is provide iodine, the second is increase iodine uptake by activation of sodium iodide supporter, third we want to actually increase production of T3 and T4 hormones, fourth is increase conversion of T4 to T3, fifth uh, we're going to talk about RXI heterodimetrization and what that actually means, uh, sixth we're going to talk about the binding of the thyroid hormone receptor complex of DNA, and seventh increase cellular response to T3. I know those last three are basically dealing with um, cellular microbiology and, and what happens at the cell signaling, but as you're going to see as we move forward through this webinar series, cell signaling is a big part of how we can improve the function of hormones. Not just thyroid, which we're discussing now, but in the future we're going to talk about how cell signaling improves adrenal function, um, androgens, estrogens, etc. So it's a really exciting stuff we're seeing now. We're moving beyond just looking at hormone levels and discussing how we can affect the function of those hormones, again, at the cellular level. Before we get into the uh, 
each of the seven specific actions involving thyroid function. I want to remind everyone, in case you haven't seen this yet, is the final therapeutic support of thyroid function document was written a number of years ago, and that discusses each of the seven steps in, in much more detail with all the scientific literature and all the references available. You can also um, read that online at the URL seen at the bottom of this page. And on that web page, you'll also be able to download the entire um, PDF as well. The first of the seven specific actions involved in um, the function and production of thyroid hormones is the thyrocytes, uh, the thyroid cells have to be provided with iodine. And now even though this many times comes from the diet, we're not seeing consistent iodine intake across the country, especially since we have such a diversity of um, living environments and dietary intake. An interesting note is that people who live in, on the coast, they actually get some of the iodine from the air because of the um, seawater churns up and the iodine becomes, um, um, you know, basically vaporized and they're inhaling it. So there's no problem for those people. But those of us living here in the Midwest, um, there's not a real consistent intake of iodine unless um, they're consuming fish on a regular basis. So um, the, the primary goal is to make sure we're getting consistent intake of the proper amount of iodine. The herbs I've chosen to provide um, specific amounts of iodine is Ascophyllum nodosum, commonly known as sea kelp, and Fucus fasciculosus, commonly known as bladder rat. One of the reasons I chose these is because some of the secondary properties that they have, and which is interesting because some of the other alternative seaweeds don't have these properties and actually may be dangerous for the thyroid, which is um, of interest. So Ascophyllum uh, also can increase glutathione peroxidase which is produced by human thyrocytes to control extracellular thyroid peroxidase. Remember, thyroid peroxidase is an oxidative enzyme that's involved in, um, in attaching the iodine to thyroid globulin. We're going to go over that a couple of times again. So the problem is if thyroid peroxidase leaks outside the cell in the wrong area, then um, you can start to have increased thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Well, the cells are designed so that they make glutathione peroxidase around the thyrocytes to prevent thyroid peroxidase from leaking. So um, glutathione is able to control the, antiox the um, oxidative stress that may cause um, autoimmune disease. Uh, Fucus fasciculosus is interesting. The literature shows that it has some estrogen modulating properties and may actually be able to protect estrogen sensitive tissue such as the thyroid. So that's one of the reasons I chose that. Both Ascophyme and Fucus have um, documented antioxidant, anti inflammatory properties, and, and these properties may also help decrease the incidence of development of uh, autoimmune thyroid disease. Two capsules of thyramend um, now provide um, 200 micrograms of iodine. Th this is what, what um, many of us consider to be the right dose. Based upon human studies, the average adult needs about 150 micrograms. Now that's average in the middle of that, you know, Gaussian curve, the 50th percentile. To make sure that we get, you know, a larger percent of the population, we add another CV to get them all the way to the end of the spectrum there, or close to it, and so that makes it about 188, and then we kind of round it up to 200. So 200 is considered a very safe dose that should cover almost everyone, or the entire population of humans, and still be below that um, the danger zone of 1,100 micrograms. The next step of the seven specific actions involving thyroid function is to increase iodine uptake by the thyrocytes. As we mentioned, and we're going to go over again, um, the thyrocytes, just providing them with iodine, putting it inside the human body is not enough. There are specific proteins, sodium iodide supporter proteins, that you have to use energy to pull the iodine across a gradient into the thyrocyte. And that takes place because they're instructed to do so by the TSH. So uh, the, uh, a great leap forward in the development of thyroid hormone therapies is our understanding of sodium iodide supporter proteins and how we can increase iodine uptake into the cell by using herbs that can mimic the acts of TSH to instruct the sodium iodide supporter protein to pull iodine inside the cell. Iodine uptake can be increased by using um, the herbs that you'll see on this page here, Humulus lopulus and Chloris foscoli. What was interesting is as I was studying how the body makes um, thyroid hormones and, and discover the actions of um, sodium iodide support protein, the first question I ask is, well, how do we, you know, make sodium iodide support protein work better? And I was obviously pleasantly surprised to find out that the literature documents that Humulus lopulus and um, Chloris foscoli both do increase sodium iodide support of function and they do this in such a way that um, you know even if the TSH is not working properly we can get the job done. 
the next other seven specific actions is to actually increase T3 and T4 production and secretion of the thyrocytes. Again, this is um, depend upon the thyrocytes being given instruction to actually do all the different uh, processes involved in um, creating thyroid globulin and uh, all the way through um, adding the iodine, etc. So there's a number of processes involved here, but the thyrocyte has to be told to do that, and we're going to find out that we can assist it in that instruction now. The production and secretion of T3 and T4 and all those processes involved in that, we now understand can be enhanced with a number of specific herbs. Colis for scoli, which we're going to talk about in detail in a moment here, has been shown to uh, encourage all the processes involved. We find Bacopa is able to increase T3 and T4 production in the same with Anusomnifera. So, so this is a very important, um, again, to leap forward in the management of thyroid function is not only is it just talk about giving the body iodine, but actually instructing the thyrocytes to do the processes that are involved in making the thyroid hormone, to, to make thyroid globulin, to, by exocytosis, put the thyroid globulin out into the thyroid follicle, to um, let it be um, addressed by thyroid peroxidase for iodinization, to conjugate the tyrosine um, components, and then to um, by endocytosis, take that modified thyroid globin back inside the cell, but proteolysis ec extract the T3 and T4 from the thyroid globulin and then be able to um, secrete the T3 and T4 into general circulation. Again, the literature tells us emphatically that specific herbs are able to instruct the thyrocyte to perform these actions. Now, while all three of the herbs I just mentioned, the coleus, the bacopa, and the methania, uh, are able to increase thyroid hormone production. The coleus has some of the most dynamic actions on it. We know Bacopa is able to increase T4 um, specifically. It doesn't seem to increase T3 as much. And we also see that um, um, uh, withania is able to increase production. But the, the coleus actions are really quite profound. What we see is it actually is able to mimic the effects of TSH. It actually tells the thyrocyte to increase the expression of the sodium iodide supporter proteins. It instructs the thyrocyte to pull more um, uh, iodine inside the cells we mentioned earlier for the increased iodine uptake. And it also increases thyroglobin production, organification of iodine secretion. So there's some really good literature about that. This may be why Colis has also been um, used uh, uh, recognized for its ability to assist with weight loss. If part of the weight gain is because of thyroid function, yes, it can help. Now, obviously, uh, improving thyroid function is more than just um, telling the thyroid to make the hormones. We have to also provide with the iodine. And more importantly, we have to be able to make sure that the end hormones get inside the cells and, and um, instruct the cells in the, of the body to respond to the thyroid hormone. Uh, which we discussed in a short time here, and obviously we have to be able to convert them. But cholesterol is an integral part of um, proper thyroid health. The next of the seven specific actions involved in thyroid function is to increase the conversion of T4 to T3. Um, the, the thyroid predominantly produces thyroxin, as we've discussed, and yes, it does make some triethyronine, some of the T3, but most of the T3 comes from peripheral conversion, conversion in tissues outside the thyroid. Yes, some is made inside the thyroid, but the, the bulk of um, the T3 inside the human body comes from peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. So when you figure out some way of making this next step happen, and again, another leap forward, because just given the body iodine, just having the hormone levels is fine, but being able to actually manipulate peripheral tissues to convert more T4 to T3 is something that is, is really exciting for us to be able to do now. And again, when you look at the references in the document I shared with you earlier, and I'll share with you again, it's well documented that a number of herbs are actually able to convert T4 to T3 um, by acting upon enzymes in the peripheral tissues. Now, you're going to recognize some of these herbs because we've talked about them already. Uh, in fact, um, you're going to recognize most of them. What we find, again, in the literature is that Coles for scoli, Humus lopulus, Rosemary, Ashwagandha, and Comifer mucal are all involved in converting T4 to T3 in the liver and other tissues. Now, what I've found over the years is I've, I, um, I've had patients that many of them were taking the, the, the Synthroid, the Levothyroxin, just the T4. And as you know, many patients out there are on that. And uh, they were having enough T4, but not enough T3. 
and we had two options in many of them of course I would put on T4 and T3 but some we were interested in um, in just seeing if we could improve the uh, conversion because you know they um, didn't want to go for the uh, more expensive on T3 um, because the, the levothyroxine obviously a generic that's very inexpensive and they wanted to try some of the herbal therapies so we found out that by adding some of these herbs we're actually able to see their T3 levels increase um, just as the, the literature tells it would so it's really qu quite an impressive uh, leap forward in the um, in the uh, treatment of thyroid function. Now part of one of the reasons that these herbs work is because um, one thing that really interferes with T4, T3 conversion is stress. Uh, too much stress can um, raise cortisol which can interfere with uh, the conversion of T4, T3. So if you look at some of these herbs you're going to recognize that um, some of them are very common to the body. Obviously Humus lopulus hops is very common anti-stress but also um, you know um, some of the herbs that we use in the formulation are going to be used just to help control stress as well. So in addition to hops another herb that is inside thyramine that has multiple properties but is actually able to decrease the stress response is actually sage. Sage is interesting the, um, when I was reading some of the studies it found that it actually can help calm down agitated patients even with um, dementia and sage uh, has a number of ways it assists with thyroid but I think that its calming properties contribute to the effectiveness of this conversion of T4, T3 because as I mentioned uh, increased cortisol, increased you know adrenaline, all these things can interfere with the conversion of T4, T3 and they drive the body to make reverse T3 to kind of protect it. So um, hops and sage have direct angiolytic common properties. You could use these herbs as primary herbs in managing stress responses uh, as far as because of the calming mildly relaxing effect. And it's an interesting point here is if you look at the totality of, of the thiamine formulation it does not have stimulating herbs inside of it. Uh, many times we see patients exposed to different you know formulations supposed to help with thyroid function and I see that they use very stimulating adaptogens. Some actually use literally stimulating herbs and I've actually unfortunately even seen caffeine in some of these quote thyroid formulas. Those don't really improve thyroid function. They give the patient a quick buzz, they feel great and they think it's their thyroid but it's not. Our, our goal is to improve thyroid function and the reality is that we don't need to use stimulating herbs to do that. We can use herbs that affect thyroid production and affect thyroid response and tissue out the body. So I definitely avoid using stimulating adaptogens. Even with Somnifera, a very significant adaptogen is not agitating. It's not as stimulating as some of the other um, ginseng adaptogens. Uh, I purposely avoid those and I purposely avoid using stimulating um, amino acids such as tyrosine that people can feel a little kick because it can raise their catecholamines but that does not a guarantee that it raises on thyroid hormone levels. In fact uh, there's no literature to substantiate the mythology that tyrosine raises thyroid hormones. As you saw in that previous discussion thyroid globulin is a very large macromolecule, very complex protein and just um, throwing tyrosine at it is not the process. The process uh, uh, that raises um, thyroid hormone levels is um, you know organification of the iodine and, and all those things we discussed in our thyroid hormone production not just throwing tyrosine at it. So now that we know how to get iodine to the cells, how to get iodine inside the thyrocytes, how to make more T3 and T4 and how to actually activate the T4 into T3 to make the most bioactive uh, form of the thyroid hormone, the most metabolically active, our next step of, of, of the seven specific actions is to actually get the thyroid hormone inside the cells of the body because otherwise it's just a messenger floating out in the blood. It has to get inside the cell and interact with it at the cellular level um, very deeply to form, to encourage that cell to do what the cell is designed to do. And the first of those uh, last three steps that have to do with cell signaling involve the, the necessity to increase RXRTR heterodimerization of the pairing of thyroid hormone receptors on the target cells out the body. So here we are. Look at, look at what we're using. We're using rosemary and sage. What's fascinating is when I was studying about heterodimerization and the pairing together of such different proteins, 
Um, we have an RxR protein, which is retinoic acid receptor. As, you, as the name implies, it's involved with vitamin A, and it's actually involved in a number of metabolic processes. Uh, it has to pair to the TR protein. As you can see on that one side of the thing, those proteins are very different molecular structures here. And how do we get those to come together? When I explain to patients, I say, other hormone receptors such as estrogen have what they call homodimers, same pairing. They have two proteins that are the same, they come together and they allow the estrogen to come inside through the estrogen receptor. So think of it as a French door. The doors open up and the hormone comes in. Now look at the thyroid receptor. You have two different doors. It's like having one door made out of wrought iron and the other one made out of wood. The more complex the hardware, the more likely you're going to have problems, okay? So the thyroid receptor is just a problem waiting to happen. It's on every cell in the body. It's two different proteins coming together. And what we find is that rosemary and sage specifically increase hydrodimerization. I'm sure that as the years go by, we're going to find countless other molecules do that. And I suspect many of them are going to be inside of our food supply, things that we eat on a common basis here. But I was very pleased to find that I could use two very safe, innocuous herbs. Because when you manipulate receptor proteins, you want to make sure you're not you know, pushing the limits of safety. And rosemary and sage are very safe. And one, and, uh, one reason why, um, the, it's just amazing how, how, uh, how much they can do is improve thyroid function. I remember many years ago, decades ago, when I was young, I was with someone eating, um, eating some Italian spaghetti and they were sitting there sweating. And I was like, why are you sweating? This, this doesn't have any of that hot Italian sausage in it. It's just spaghetti sauce, with, you know, Italian herbs. And they go, I know, man, I eat this stuff and I sweat. Well, here it is decades later, now I know why. That person probably had um, thyroid receptor dysfunction. They ate a meal that had lots of rosemary and sage. In the metabolism camp, they got hot and started sweating. Fascinating. So um, rosemary and sage are added inside there um, at the right thing to improve this function. And people do notice that. They do feel a little warmer after taking this herb if they're the ones that have the shutdown receptors. Again, part of thyroid hormone function is getting the receptors to come together. And these two herbs promote RxRTI heterodimerization on the target cells throughout the entire body. So the next step is how do we get the um, receptors to connect with the DNA? Remember, hormones don't do anything. They're messengers. They have to tell the cell to do what the cell was designed to do. And to do that, we want to find out which herbs have been documented as increasing the binding of thyroid hormone receptor complex, the DNA. Remember, the, the, the hormone is going to bind to the RxRTR. And now you have a thyroid hormone slash receptor complex. And it has to bind to DNA. Okay, so when I was looking at this specific step in thyroid function, I said, okay, well, this is getting a little bit, um, you know, deep. We're having to talk about, you know, um, molecular biology and looking at RNA receptor function, et cetera, and DNA and, and all these things. So, again, I went to literature and I looked at um, which... Uh, natural products could affect this, and we found some of the same herbs of interest. Hops, common from Macau, rosemary, again, in ashwagandha. Uh, in the literature, these do affect um, hormone receptor complexes binding to DNA. So the message is, we have the receptor, the message is actually getting to DNA, and then we have to discuss uh, what the next step is going to be. So the last step that is involved in the process is actually being able to improve gene expression. As you recall, gene expression is that the cell is actually able to do what the DNA is asking to do. The hormone gets the cell all the way to the DNA and the message is received, but receiving the message even then is not enough. The gene has to be able to cause the change in the cell. In many cases, this means, of course, creating a protein that is in response to the direct message. So in order to affect gene expression, we want to choose uh, herbal therapies that are able to improve the tissue's response and specifically, you know, cause gene expression. What was fascinating is as I reviewed the literature, we're actually able to find uh, specific plants that have been documented to improve uh, tissue response gene expression. And that includes uh, Humus lopulus, Comifer mucau, Rose and Methania. You can be familiar with those herbs because we've talked about some of the other functions that they have. But the last and final step is, 
to make sure that the cells actually do what they have been told to do by the messenger being the hormone. And um, these specific plants have been documented as promoting gene expression so that once they get their instruction from the hormone, they actually respond to it. The seven specific uh, actions involved in proper thyroid function then can be summarized in this chart that talks about the seven specific actions of thyramend, again, which was designed to provide iodine, increase iodine uptake, produce increase the production of hormones, convert T4, T3, increase receptor function, promote binding to DNA, and promote genetic expression of cellular response. In the chart, you can see how s some herbs have multiple qualities and some have only one or two qualities, but it was a compilation of the various herbal therapies together and trying to find out the right combination that, that we're able to arrive at the conclusion that we actually can improve thyroid function, not just the production, but most importantly, all the way down to tissue response. Uh, so this chart summarizes the specific actions of each of those herbs. And again, the references to this is available on the document. Again, these are the seven specific actions that we're able to accomplish by using thyramine. But keep in mind, again, it's not just the thyramine, it's the lifestyle, the essential fatty acids, the um, you know nutritional support, and um, proper use of probox. All these things are important as well. But once those foundations are stabilized, then the thyramine is actually able to increase um, hormone production all the way down to um, function of the, at the cellular level. Now we're going to talk about the next step, about how to actually use this formulation in a very unique way. If you look real closely at many of the constituents of thiamine, you're going to notice there's a lot of herbs that may be ascribed as having adaptogen properties. Uh, substances that help the body adapt to stress and to change. And as such, one thing that we know about adaptogens is that they can transform how the body functions and improve the function of tissues. And many times over the years, I've found that using adaptogens work best at a certain level. So I usually stop people at a lower dose. So the patients will take uh, two capsules a day for, you know, one to a few weeks. And then after, that's like the initial dose. Then during the restoration stage, they'll take four capsules a day. And then we do that for one to three months. And what I say to patients during the first visit is, we're going to get you up to the restoration dosage. You're going to take four capsules a day for one to three months. And when you can come to me and say, you know, I'm feeling pretty good now. I think that we've accomplished our goal. And then they ask that question, do I still need to take four capsules a day? Well, obviously the answer is no. They're ready to go into the maintenance stage. So at that point, I drop them down to two capsules per day. And, and they're able to maintain the function. And one way I describe this to patients is it, you, it initially it takes more energy to get to the top of the wellness plateau than it does to stay there. So once you're there, the maintenance dose will keep you there. And then you'll learn that in the future, if you have an event that requires you to go back up the high dose for a week or two or a month, that's fine. But most of the patients do good with not just thyramine, but all of the hormone-specific formulations that we're going to discuss in this series, the the estramend, the testagain, the progestamend, and of course adrenamend, all of these work um, quite well by doing a 242 dosage protocol designed specifically for hormone specific formulations to initialize the dose, uh, um, focus, focus on restoration, and then achieve um, maintenance of the dosage. And as many times as we've gone over the seven specific actions that are involved in the production of thyroid hormones, in the back of your mind, I'm sure, and one thing that I've come to realize, because patients have asked is, what do you do when the thyroid has been destroyed by autoimmune disease or it's been removed surgically? That's a very important question because the reality is, is if the thyroid has been destroyed by autoimmune disease, if the th especially if it's been removed surgically, then some of those initial steps really aren't going to apply. It doesn't matter how much iodine you give the human body, if the thyroid's somewhere in a jar and some shelf, is not going to make the hormone for that patient. So the next step is to understand how thyroid is especially beneficial for those patients that have had the thyroids destroyed by autoimmune disease, surgically, or even by uh, medications that they sometimes use to destroy the thyroid. And the answer to that question is obviously very clear. What we're doing is the patient is typically on thyroid hormone replacement therapy. So thyramine can be used as an adjuvant, as an adjunct to support thyroid hormone replacement. 
Uh, what I've found over the years, in fact, part of my development of this formulation is many of my patients were taking thyroid hormone replacement therapy, and we realized that it really failed to accomplish the desired outcomes. Either they weren't converting T4 to T3, or more importantly, because they had thyroid resistance and the cells weren't listening. So even though the first three steps are, you know, may not apply to these people, uh, we found out that the thyramend does help increase the conversion of T4, T3. They're taking leave with thyroxine. You want them to have triadothyronine. You want them to have the T3. This will help convert T4, T3. And more importantly is at the cell signaling level, thyramend is actually able to increase RxRT heterodimerization. The receptors increase binding to the DNA and increase genetic expression. So those things are very important. Now keep this in mind if you review all these herbs in totality, you're going to find that, that many of these herbs have multiple properties. And even the seaweed, even though the iodine is not really going to be helping these people at that level, we know iodine is beneficial for other tissues. So I say, yes, you should still take iodine, uh, even though you don't have a thyroid. And we also know that the, um, the seaweeds that we use have other important properties, as you mentioned. They have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties as well. So yes, I have many patients that find that taking thyramend improves the um, function of hormone replacement therapy. Thyroid hormone replacement therapy is not enough. It's never been enough. If we look real closely at these patients, they need to improve conversion and more importantly they need to improve cell signaling so the thyroid is being replaced gets where it needs to be gets inside the cell and accomplishes the changes of, of the cells throughout the body now another way of saying that and to be very clear and, and i show this to, to patients is that patients on levothyroxine can still have problems converting t4 t3 they still have problems with rxi heterodimerization they still have problems of binding the thyroid hormone receptor complex of dna and they still have problems with cellular response to t3 by target gene expression so it's important that patients who are not responding to appropriate doses of thyroid replacement therapy are, are given this opportunity many times they'll, they'll, they'll present themselves to us or to other clinicians going I need more thyroid hormone. What they need is the body to listen to the thyroid replacement therapy that they're giving. And, um, and this is what, uh, what we found with thyramine. Again, part of my developing this formula is I had a lot of patients that were on thyroid replacement therapy and we didn't get our uh, the outcome that we wanted. So both patients that had poor thyroid function, with the formulation helps them improve people that have no thyroid function it helps the tissue response and as I mentioned earlier the 242 doses schedule is especially important in these patients because if they have high amounts of T4 in the blood and it's not converting you don't you want to start at the second at the two capsule dose to slowly increase the conversion get, let the metabolism come up before you put them on the full um, dosage of four things and again those patients usually um, find tremendous outcomes pretty quickly actually if they have lots of T4 we give them a couple of these get them up to the full dose then we can wean them down to maintenance and uh, it, it's very impressive to see what happens when the body actually actually start to listen to the hormones that we've been trying to give them in, for in many cases years so the next question that came up was, well, were the patients already on T3? Well, I still found this helpful because I had patients that were on, you know, the, the, the um, porcine uh, thyroid, whether it be the Armour brand name or other porcine thyroid formulations. They were on compounded T3 and T4. Some of them were just taking Cytomel, the leothyronine, the, the T3 only. And we still saw it. we're not getting the clinical outcomes that we want because, again, the cells weren't listening. One of the sayings I say to patients time and time again, it's not just the levels, it's the listening. And Thyramend is able to increase RxI hetero, TR heterodimerization, increase the thyroid hormone receptor binding to the DNA, and increase tissue response. So again, patients on thyroid replacement therapy have, can have significant thyroid resistance, even if they don't need you know, the conversion there. Um, so um, this has been quite amazing and again start them on two work up to four and many times these people feel great um, uh, sooner than people that um, um, don't that we've tried to increase diet function because they already have high amounts of T3 and T4 especially T3 and we can wean them down to maintenance they do quite well other important considerations that um, need to be discussed when we look at thyroid hormone function is how different medications can interact with thyroid hormones Medications can affect thyroid 
hormone function adversely by a, num a number of different ways. One is they can actually inhibit thyroid hormone synthesis, um, uh, such as the uh, thionamides, the, um, some of the sulfonamides, and lithium can actually do that as well. Another way they can actually either increase or decrease the concentration of thyroid binding globulin to make it so that the um, um, you know the, the, there's less of a free T3, free T4 that's available. Uh, another way they can inhibit thyroid hormone binding to thyroid globulin, the salicylates and other medications. And uh, uh, one of the biggest areas I see a problem with is is the inhibition of conversion of T4, T3. We have many patients that walk on on beta blockers and um, that seems to be the, the, the largest number of patients I see where this is being affected. Yes, those in amiodarone and glucocorticoids are also affected, but many times these, uh, these heart patients are wind up with, with progressive loss of quality of life because they no, no longer convert in T4 to T3, and the docs sometimes are remiss about putting them on a, a, um, a product that has T3 inside of it, so they can take these herbs that are quite safe and get the conversion, get the um, increased function they want. And the fifth um, documented way that medications can interfere with thyroid hormones is they can stimulate uh, degradation uh, or fecal excretion of thyroid hormones uh, by a number of different medications. It, it, this is just a point to look at what medications your patients are on and see if they have the um, adverse reaction to thyroid hormones. And that may give us more indications to why we need to support these patients with nutritional and um, herbal therapies such as thyramine. As uh, was already mentioned, one of the most important educational documents about phyotherapeutic supportive thyroid function is a new to news that was written a number of years ago. This has um, a little more even scientific detail about all of the specific actions involved in thyroid hormone function. And in addition, it has all the references you can look at. You can get that from the Douglas Laboratories website, looking at their new to news archives. At the same time, you can find it on the website yourhormones.com slash thyroid slash thyroid underscore uh, function dot html. And uh, as I also mentioned, you'll find the questions other resources on that website as well. This is, this is a very valuable tool for patient education as well. I find patients want to know more and really get involved with their work. And uh, many of them have been very... Um, comforted by after reading this thing and they really feel more confident what they're doing and um, you know this gives them the scientific stuff about why we're putting them on uh, these herbal therapies to, to improve their thyroid function so it's a very well received document by patients as well in conclusion we can simply say this that thyramine supports proper thyroid function by all the steps we talked about from providing iodine right down to genetic expression and we're having some great results with this uh, the patients are, are having better quality of life. It improves our ability to improve thyroid function. It's not just hormone levels, it's the listening. And this formulation was designed to improve cellular listening, first and foremost, and to accomplish all the goals of proper thyroid function. Uh, if you have any questions, you can um, get in touch with me by the contact information that I'll show in the next slide. Now, I do encourage clinicians to drop me an email to go to the website and study this information. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to work with healthcare professionals around the world and to do case reviews together and to debate some of the new discoveries that uh, we're learning about, not just thyroid hormone function, but adrenal and men's health, women's health, as will be discussed for the webinars. Again, my contact information can be found in yourhormones.com. You can contact me directly at jcollins at yourhormones.com. And there's my other contact information to make it easy for you to get in touch with me. And I look forward to working with all of you further as we continue to improve our patient's thyroid function. Stay well.